He walks into that guarded space and says, okay. And what does he do? He invites him in to touch his hand, to be in his side. And what I, I kind of just want to address that today and, and really look. Thomas was wanting proof. And the wounds and scars he saw was going to be that proof. He says, I want to see the wounds. I want to touch the scars. I want to put my hand in the side, deep into that hurt. And Jesus' response to that, first of all, he's unafraid. Yeah, go ahead. He says, I'm unafraid to let you in. So he didn't show them because, you know, they... Um, he didn't not show them because he knew they've got a mission and he doesn't want them to think he can't protect them. Think about it. He's about to go tell the disciples, go and tell. You want to remind them what happened to you? <laughs> I go and tell. Oh, don't worry about it. It's good. I got you. But that's what he did. He's not afraid. He says, come on in. Jesus was willing why was he willing to show, not just the disciples, not just Thomas, why was he willing to always open up those scars, that wound? Why? Because he was interested in Thomas believing. And when you're interested in Thomas believing, then of course, if that's what it takes, then that's what you do. And that's where Jesus is. Three, he says, I, I said, you know, I love this, because I something the Lord has given me. He didn't say, you know, I've got to have some time, boys. <laughs> you would not believe the week I had. <laughs> I, I mean, I was betrayed by one of my buddies. Oh, my goodness. And then it was terrible. I was falsely in prison. I had to go to court. It was so cruel. They were so mean to me there. And then they started torturing me and crucified me. Ugh, and then three days in a grave, and you would not believe what I did when I was dead. <laughs> I need some time. I need some time. I'll show you the wounds, but ooh, I need some time. I am not quite ready. But because Jesus was wanting, desiring, passionate about Thomas's belief, there was nothing that was going to stop him from showing the hands, from letting him in to those deep, dark places. I think we can easily see where I'm going here. We have got to be willing to let people into our story. We have got to be willing to open up our hands, open up our scars, let people into the wounds. I love that Jesus did this. I love that in the passage he says, as my Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. That's not just about go and tell. When you look at that in the Greek, it also speaks of the manner in which he did that. Okay, so he always opens up. He always invites the, the disciples into his story. You start in the beginning. Follow me. Jump in, boys. We're about to have three fun years. He invites them to be part of what he's doing. He invites them into his story. Well, it continues, right? Because you can see how often he has them be a part. You look at the feeding of the 5,000. He doesn't just do that. He includes them. He's inviting them into a story. Then let's talk about the hurting spaces. The, when Jesus was in the garden, he knows the anguish he is about to face. Hey, guys, I'm up here. He knows the anguish he's about to face, and guess what he does? He invites them to pray, invites them into that place of anguish, and invites them to prepare for what's coming. He's always inviting them into his story. Man, if Jesus says, this is the way the Father sent me, and in that same space, I want you, in that same manner, to go and tell. I want you to go and tell by inviting people into your story. And here's the thing. It's so beautiful that we have this part of Jesus' story. Because he didn't just invite people to the miracles. He invited them into the wounds. He invited them into the hurting. And he was unafraid that it just happened and I'm still getting over this and I still got things. And third, he understood 
that those scars no longer labeled him a victim, that did not make him a victim, that made him victor. Some of us have so many stories to tell, and we have hidden them for so long, right? Because people would see me differently, people wouldn't understand, that's behind me, that's way far behind me. But what God is saying in this story, unafraid. Look, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. And this is Paul. I need a drink. This is Paul. And he says, he says, <laughs> he says, look, but his grace, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now let's, let's back up. Because we don't want to miss this and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? It's on Bible covers. <laughs> it's on a poster. Isn't that a great verse? Here's the truth. That's a no answer from God. Paul asked, Paul prayed, hey, I've got this horrible, horrible thing. I know this is from the devil, God. Will you take it from me? Three times, the Bible says he pleaded. Look at the verse before. Three times he pleaded. But he said, this is what God answered. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. No. You don't get what you want, but you get me. And I'm enough. Okay, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Here's the, here's the truth for the day. Is that Paul, even in this, invited us into his weakness, didn't he? He said, look, i got issues. i got things. I've had no answers from God. I've had some heartbreak. I've had some hurts. I'm not afraid for you to see that. I'm not afraid to invite you in. Why? For my power is made perfect in weakness. This is God talking. God says his power is made perfect in weakness. Now, when you look at that, it actually doesn't mean perfect the way we see perfect, like somebody in Russian magazine. It means perfect as in, okay, as in seen, visible, able to be seen. Even a, it says even as kind of like a light shined on it. So in my weakness, when I let people into my stories, now God's power is seen. So ergo, we're all logical people, I hope. If I don't let people into my story, what would we say would be the opposite of that? God's power is not seen. See, what you need to understand is your story is the exact way that Jesus is sending you into this world to share his good news. Your story. Nobody has one like it. That's why you're still here on this planet. Because that story is important and there's somebody who needs to hear that story. That wound needs opened for somebody. But if we're going to be so cautious and afraid and not understanding what the resurrection did for us, that we are victors, we are not victims, it doesn't matter what that story looks like because Jesus, his grace is sufficient. You see how that shifts things? We can't be afraid to share. What I love is that Jesus was about this even as he walked. This is what he did. In fact, let's go into really quickly to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says six days before the Passover. So again, this is before that triumphal entry. We'll talk about next week into Palm Sunday. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus had a story. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. How powerful, right? Just Lazarus' presence marked his story. Let's jump into verse 9 from the same chapter. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So what are we gathering from that? 
People came to see Jesus? Yes. There's people searching. They want to hear what Jesus has to say. And there are some people that will gather with us, that will see the sign. The Holy Spirit will speak to them and say, you know what, I, just, I need to check that out. And then there's some people in the crowds who say, man, that guy is different. <laughs> he was dead and now he's alive. That's why I'm coming to gathering. And so the question here today is, who is not here today because you haven't opened up your wounds? Who is not here today because you haven't invited them into your story? We all understand why we don't do that. Fear. Not having the kingdom mindset. This person needs God. Right? We can get so busy in our life, we forget. They're not just my co-worker. There's a soul in there, believe it or not, right? And, and that soul is going to spend somewhere in eternity, so it's important that I'm sharing. And that's what's so cool about seeing Jesus. I think if it's me, I'm like Thomas. You've been with me for years. You don't get it. Peace out, right? You know, like, no, you're not sticking your finger in my, you know, in my palm. But that's not who Jesus is because his heart beats for Thomas. He has a passion for Thomas to believe. How can we do any less? How can we do any less? So as Easter is coming, here's the Lord saying, invite, 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 invite. You gotta be willing to open up. You gotta be willing to get intimate, to be real with people, to be authentic. You all know my story just from six, seven weeks ago. I've lost now both parents in less than a year. Look, that's not easy to talk about. That's not something I'm like, woohoo, you wanna hear what I'm going through? But when people ask, how dare I not be honest? How dare I? Because you know the truth? I'm getting through that. Because if I can't, I make a liar out of myself about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If I can't move through these hard times, I mean, Jesus calls himself the resurrection. He doesn't just resurrect. He says, that's who I am. That's what I do. That's my character. So how dare I not point to how, yes, I can overcome death. Yes, because I serve the resurrection. So I let people in. And sometimes that means tears. Sometimes I'm good. And sometimes when I'm good, you can tell people, are like, are you really good? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm really good in this moment. <laughs> but you all have the same stories. There is someone in gathering here today, we asked her to share her story. We were at partnership meetings um, a month ago-ish, about a month ago, and she began to share just where the Lord has taken her. Hey, I just want you to know her story. First of all, you know, you know some of us say, our story's not that great, you know. <coughs> it is what it is. This is not a woman who has overcome cancer or overcome these big stories that we feel like if we don't have that story, then that's not that's not a win that we should, you know, even need to open because it's not a big deal. This is just her story with God. And it's authentic and it's real and I dare you not to be moved by it. So this is Amanda Lindquist. Hi, my name is Amanda Lindquist. I am a partner of Radius, but I have been attending Radius um, since May of last year. And this is my story. <laughs> so last year would um, probably be the hardest year of my life. Um, 2015 is not a year that I necessarily want to remember, but I'm very thankful for. Um, the year started off, um, my husband and I and my two kids were living in Utah and my husband was going to school to be a helicopter pilot and we were financially having some troubles um maritally having some troubles but things were still pretty good um, we wanted to expand our family we wanted to uh, you know get to florida as quickly as possible around family um, we had this plan of 
you know, Ryan graduating helicopter school and um, working for the school and building up his hours so that we could eventually be back here. Um, in April, we found out that um, Upper Limit, which is the school he attended, was not going to hire him. So our world kind of crushed. Um, we had kind of been on a roller coaster ride for the last four years since my husband um, separated from the Army. And we've just kind of been trying to figure out what God wants us to do. So definitely a roller coaster, um, stuck together, held strong, expanded our family, still doing as well as we could, happy. Um, but we just were kind of uh, just ready to be settled, ready to find our place in this world. And once we found that out, it just, it crushed me and my spirits and my relationship with God. Um, so from then on out, um, my, me and my two kids moved back to Florida to um, live here while Ryan finished out some training and made some money for us to live off of. Um, still having to really rely, unfortunately, on credit cards a little more than we wanted to. Um, and we um, had just a really rough summer. So when um, my husband came to visit the kids and I in the middle of the summer, we were so excited. We hadn't seen him. We'd been missing him. I was, um, I had, was pregnant with baby number three. Um, so surviving, but definitely having a hard time taking care of two little ones and being pregnant. Um, so excited to see him. He came to visit. Um, we got to go on a really special date night, which unfortunately ended in some very tragic news. My husband decided to burst my bubble once more <laughs> with a little um, deployment uh, information that he was going to be deploying in January of 2016 for six months, two months after our third child was born. Again, to say things were rough, things just got rougher. <laughs> we accepted it, prayed about it as much as we could, but I just couldn't seem to get out of my phone. I stopped um, not believing, but definitely trusting, and my relationship just kept going further and further away from God. We, again, struggled financially. Um, my husband did not have a job once he moved back from Utah to Florida. Um, no job, a baby on the way, two younger kids, um, just all that financial stuff we had going on and just really not happy. I wasn't happy, I was not myself, and it was really, really hard to just wake up every day. Um, I cried a lot, um, and I didn't lean on God like I should have, and that was very discouraging to my husband and myself, because as much as I wanted to, I just didn't. I just couldn't. I was so upset with him with everything that had happened in the past four years with just Ryan giving 150% but not finding our way. So um, in October, um, we had our precious little blessing, uh, Sadie Grace, on October 29th. And um, the beginning of the year, it was rough to even think that I was pregnant and we were having another child. Like why would God let this happen when he knew things were gonna be so tough? But he knew that that's what I needed. I needed her to let me see the light. So November, Ryan and I had a long discussion and we decided that I needed something. So I kind of just consciously said, something has got to give. So if we give, I wonder what that can happen for. Like what would that give back to us? So, you know, I'm not exactly sure how much we started giving in the beginning. Um, I just told Ryan, what we can, let's do that. And then when you deploy and we start getting a paycheck, then it will be 10%, no matter what. Before anything else gets paid, we pay raises our tithe. Um, and so we, once I committed to that, it's almost like things started kind of just happening, positive things. My mindset, my relationships with people, um, 
my love for my kids, my, my praying, it just kind of seemed to just snowball in the right direction. Unlike the beginning of the year where everything snowballed and it just kept, you know, rolling, 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 bad, 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 bad. And actually when I was writing this, my testimony down um, to talk today, I uh, <laughs> said something, and someone's probably already said this, but it, it kind of was clever. It said, I was having a humongous pity party and the devil was there with his dancing shoes and he was just having the best time because he was just in there dancing and partying and I don't want that anymore. I want to be dancing at my own party. No more pity party. I'm healthy, my kids are healthy, my husband's healthy. We just are gonna figure it out and I just believe wholeheartedly that just you know, turn, you know, nothing happened when I stopped praying. Nothing got better. Nothing, it just got worse. So once I turned around and thought to myself, okay, I need a positive attitude, I need God, I need prayer, I need my small group, um, I need just to be positive. And I, don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect. I have my days that I want to stay in bed and cry and miss my husband, but I have God and he basically is my best friend right now and we talk a lot. <laughs>